We are thrilled, or I am thrilled certainly, to be here in one of the first few of these interviews with people that I've known for many, many years, and people that truly have changed the way that gender plays a role in academia and how women academicians uh, are treated. Let me begin by introducing them quickly. Uh, Lorna Gibson to my left. Uh, Lorna is a professor of material sciences in the Department of Civil Engineering and Mechanical Engineering. She just recently retired. Uh, and she was the former chair of the faculty at MIT. Professor Lottie Balin, she is a professor in the School of Management at MIT, also retired. And then Professor Sylvia Sayer. Sylvia was a member of the regional group of the Women in Science team. She is a chemist, very renowned chemist, member of the National Academy of Sciences. She was also the chair of the, uh, the head of the Department of Chemistry at MIT. Wonderful to have you all. It's really apropos, I should say, that we're talking about gender at the time when, for the first time, the Nobel Prize is awarded in economics for somebody who yes. work on issues of gender and the workforce. So, and Claudia Golden, uh, this is a first, and I'm so thrilled that it coincided with, with this. So thank you again, and it's wonderful to be together. Let me begin by, by uh, asking all of you, and we'll go one by one, how did you get involved? What was your role? Let's set that first. Well, um, I was in the civil engineering department and when I was coming up through being a junior faculty and trying to get tenure, I, I noticed that quite a number of my male colleagues were from MIT. They had either done their bachelor's degree or their graduate degree at MIT. And I realized that they sort of had a connection with the other faculty in the department that I didn't have because I didn't come from MIT. And as I started looking around more and more, I thought that, that this really was a big advantage to have that. And I started to think more about about women at MIT and where they had done their degrees and were they from MIT or not. And I realized that quite a number of the women in engineering were not from MIT. And after I got tenure, I started having some lunches with the, with the women faculty in engineering. So this must have been maybe 91, 92, something like that. And we sort of had these informal lunches for quite some time. And then when Nancy was getting involved with the women in science, I think Penny Chisholm introduced us and, uh, and we began talking together. So I was following what was going on in science as well. I had really a peripheral role, um, but I happened to be at the right place at the right time. And as chair of the faculty could uh, control a little bit the agenda of what was going on. And my feeling was I wanted to check that with you, Sylvia, that once you had gotten a lot of the things that you wanted, that you were willing, that was it, go back to science. But I knew that this wasn't only a matter of science, and that so I tried very hard in various ways to make sure my goal was to get it to the rest of the faculty. Yeah, so um, I was uh, one of the members of um, the women in the School of Science who originally uh, got together in uh, the spring of 1994. And uh, we worked together to try to acquire some data in order to put some substance to some of the things that we were concerned about. And so uh, I continued to function with, uh, with my uh, female colleagues. Uh, and um, it certainly is true that uh, we thought, OK, once we get these data, and once we present this to the administration, we can fix the problem just like <laughs> that. And we can go back to doing our laboratory work. <laughs> what made it possible? And we're going to get deeper into that, but on a first brush, what, what is it that it went from just collecting data to actually happening, yeah. Yeah. creating some action? And any of you can feel free to answer that. I think a key point was, as you suggest, working together collectively. But that Bob Bergenau, who was dean at the time. Um, dean of science. Dean of science, sorry. And 
when you all came, or at least that's the way he's told me, when you all came and sat in his office and told these stories, he knew, of course, how successful these women were. And he was able to realize that this has to be systemic. You can't have all these very successful women telling similar kinds of stories. So, Lorna, you, you were in engineering and you picked up the momentum of the women in science uh, group and decided we need to do the same in engineering. Tell me about it or tell us about it. Well, how, did yeah. it go up, how did you go about it? Did you follow the same model? What was different? So, you know, by the time we did the engineering study, the science study had already come out. And Chuck Vest, the president, and Bob Brown, the provost, and Tom McNanty, the dean, were, were very supportive. So we, we formed a committee, and I chaired the committee. And uh, we, did a, we had a similar process. So we interviewed each of the women individually, at least all of the ones who wanted to be interviewed. And we also gathered data, and we looked at things like lab space and teaching loads, and we looked at salaries. Uh, we looked at uh, some things to do with uh, family and work issues. You know, one of the things we found was that some women complained that they were teaching more undergraduate level subjects than that were sort of more introductory level rather than more research based graduate st subjects. Um, but we followed a very similar process, I think. The provost asked every school right. to do this. So I was chair of the school of, of Sloan School of Management. We had a slightly different approach that we also interviewed all the senior women. I think there were seven, <laughs> maybe eight. <laughs> and we tried to get a comparable sample of men. So we paired each senior woman with someone in a similar field, some similar stage, as best as we could. And all those men, if I remember correctly, actually agreed to be interviewed. Mm -hmm. And we found surprising differences in their experience of MIT, of Sloan, in how they felt about belonging, and as well as all the data. We did the hiring and the salary data also. Our dean at that time had a very interesting response when we sent him the report. He said, I didn't know there were two Sloans, one for men and one for women. That's a very interesting comment. So he, he registered on yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Sylvia, you were in the midst of a, of a great career at the time where you were incredibly busy. You were presented with a situation by Nancy Hopkins and other colleagues. What made you make the decision to put aside, because you had to sacrifice something, to spend the time doing this? Well, when Nancy and I first met in the spring of uh, 1994, she wanted to talk about my experiences as a faculty member uh, in the chemistry department. But she also told me about her experiences. And uh, one of the difficulties that she had was just in acquiring 200 square feet extra lab space to put some fish tanks in so that she could start a new direction in her laboratory. And uh, her requests for that 200 square feet from the department or to the department were just really ignored. And when she told me this, you know, my reaction was, was similar to what I learned later on was Mark Wrighton's reaction. Mark Wrighton was the provost at MIT at the time and my former uh, colleague in the Department of Chemistry. What I learned is that when she asked him for that 200 square feet, his response was, I have never had a faculty member ask me for so little. There's just uh, no way that I could not. Uh, be a part of this uh, effort to try to rectify some of these things and a lot of other commonalities that uh, came across uh, once the women got together and uh, talked about it. I mean, ultimately, you know, we decided that uh, we had to make a plan and uh, try to get these things to be rectified. And if we didn't, we would just continue to be working a whole lot harder than 92% of the other faculty were. In this uh, uh, film, Picture a Scientist, 
there is an analogy between uh, gender discrimination and an iceberg, right? 10% of that iceberg is above the surface of the water where it can be seen. And that 10% an analogy are, are uh, you know, unwanted sexual uh, advances and coercion. That's the part of the iceberg and the issues that are uh, visible and that are in the public eye. But it's the 90% of that iceberg. It's all of this collection of these smaller issues being mm. devalued, not listened to, invisible on committees, um, not being given positions of responsibility, or the opposite, uh, being uh, asked to do service tasks to an extreme. All of these things accumulated. That's what ultimately mm. just mm. Uh, knocks you down. What do you tell a young woman academician coming up in the ranks now how how do you talk to them do you can you say you're okay things are fine do your thing or do you say watch for this and watch for that what what is the message you give them have have we turned the corner i think we need to give a message to the institutions because i think what has not been done is to look at the structure of the academic career, to look at the accepted practices, uh, and a lack of realization that this vision of the individual heroic scientist who's competitive with everyone else is A, doesn't fit the way science works now, and B, obviously will disadvantage women. So I think we've done a failed or somewhat good thing on talking about these unconscious biases that both men and women have, but we haven't really pushed at the structures and the practices, the culture, if you will, mm. that surrounds academia and science in particular. Yeah. Well, one of my pet peeves when we were doing these studies was the MIT benefit system. Mm -hmm. So the benefit system was set up decades ago. And if you were a guy with a wife at home and kids, man, it was gravy. I mean, just supported you in all manner of ways. But many of the women didn't have kids. They didn't have a partner at home. And the whole benefit system just didn't really exactly. work the same exactly. way. And I, I tried to get MIT to change it, not with much success, but uh, it, I found that enormously frustrating because it, it's, it was set up for one kind of situation, and a lot of the women didn't fit into that situation. I remember we looked at the, the tenured women in engineering when we did our study. Half of them didn't have kids. And you know you don't get tenure until you're mid-30s, late-30s, and so you might expect that those women would have had kids if they were going to. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the sort of demographics was totally different, and and yet the the benefits that system, which really is a way of supporting faculty, just didn't recognize that. So I always found that a huge frustration. When you tackle a problem, unavoidably, by definition, there is friction. In your experience with this, uh, as you spend years working on this. Do you feel that your relationships to colleagues, both men and women, were in any way hurt significantly or not? Or it was, or it was really relatively smoothly, smooth going? I don't know. I, I felt it was relatively smooth going. In fact, I found sometimes um, there were things that came out of the committee. For instance, one of the things that happened was that the dean tried to get departments to adhere to best practices and faculty searches. So having things like having a woman on a search committee, on each search committee. And another thing he asked the search committees to do is, you know, typically if there's a search, you call people at other universities that you know, and you say, we have a search in area X, and can you recommend anybody? And the dean said, if, if, if you get recommendations that are all the name of men, just ask directly, are there any women who you would like to mm -hmm. recommend? And I remember in one search committee in another department, you know, this this kept happening. The guys on the committee would ask and ask their male colleagues at some other university, and and they would just get the name of men back. Mm. And when they asked about women candidates, the guy at the other end would go, 
oh yeah, you know what? There's there's so and so, and she's really good. And sometimes that person would apply. And when the MIT faculty saw how good that woman was, it really made them realize that they'd been missing out, that there were probably other women that they'd overlooked and hadn't been recommended. And I think it really changed the way they looked at the searches and it changed the way they viewed how do we get the best people? Because ultimately, I think MIT is a meritocracy. People want to get the best new faculty they can. You made tremendous success. Mm -hmm. But I still see the other side. For example, the MIT report went out just before to the faculty, went out the Friday before spring vacation. And the reports in the Globe and the Times were during spring vacation. At the end of spring vacation, the women had a big celebration. Remember, <laughs> we had a big, and the men said nothing. Mm. You know, uh, and one I remember, which shows how luck also played a role in this. The day after this was on the front page, um, the Korean airplane was shot down. Mm. And one man who was in the governance of the faculty, which is why I knew him, came to me and said, isn't it too bad that you hit it just before, implying that if it had happened on that day, we would not have been on the front page, and wouldn't that have been good? Mm -hmm. What's the implication? Mm -hmm. Well, that was not how we were seeing it, mm -hmm. because we knew that being on those front pages was one of the things that had to happen to have this wide impact. Mm -hmm. Was there any moment, maybe Sylvia, you, you, you can address this, that you felt Something went wrong, and this is not going to happen. Or, 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 or uh, the type of visibility that we needed is not there. Where you have to sort of take a deep breath and say, "All right, let's try something else." Did that ever happen? Oh, that happened a lot. It happened a lot in the beginning when uh, the women were getting together and writing a letter to approach the dean with the idea for forming a committee. Getting that committee which ultimately then got some data, was not a straightforward path. It took uh, a lot of uh, convincing. It took uh, the enrollment of at least one of the department heads in the School of Science at that time to try to convince the higher administration that this is what we really should do. Um, and originally, the uh, department heads in the School of Science, uh, not all of them were in favor. But, uh, you know, we pursued. and. Um, you know, we were fortunate to find some uh, male faculty members who were like-minded. And I think they played a very essential role in uh, getting things to continue to move forward. And I think on our committee, you know, later on, uh, we had men on the committee too, and we deliberately asked to have men on the committee who had had some administrative experience. Mm -hmm. So I think one had been department head, one had been associate dean, because yes. none of the women had had that experience and they didn't know, you know, how things worked at that level. And it was helpful to have men with that experience on the committee. That's a very important point. And you actually addressed something like that, Lorna, right at the beginning, uh, the, the knowing the ropes, right, of how, how, how things happen right. uh, is, is critical. Right, right. Otherwise, you, you spin a lot of wheels, and that's where the role you had, Lottie, was mm -hmm. so important right. because you, you were in there. You could go and in, walk into the office of the president, and he and would I, have to yeah, talk I, to you. <laughs> yeah, and asked him to write a foreword to the report, and what he wrote played a huge role because he wrote, he now realizes that gender discrimination is not only perception, or half perception, half reality, is more reality. And everyone picked that up. And there was an editorial in the San Francisco Chronicle that said, he's just let himself open to suits. And one of the things that was important is, MIT didn't have a general counsel at that time. I'm sure if, 
he had asked a lawyer, can I say this? They would have said, Madam, you're lying. I, I am sure you're right. <laughs> so let, 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 me, let me ask you a question also. Clearly, you had a, a tremendous impact at MIT, right? And we have been talking a lot about the, the history of, of the MIT experience and, and the success it had here. But what can you tell me about the impact that it has had in academia in general, in the rest of the nation? When the Globe, and particularly the Times, came out, the emails, I mean, mostly to Nancy, but I got lots and lots. She went, as you know, to the White House. The Clintons thanked her. Chuck Vest, as president of MIT, set up what became to be known as the Committee of Nine. When the report became publicized, Harvard, Yale, and Stanford all said, isn't it interesting about MIT, but it doesn't happen here. <laughs> well, Chuck Vest got eight other presidents together. I remember this vividly. He was in a room with these eight others trying to get this statement out. The statement said, among other things, we acknowledge that this happens at our institution and we'll try to do something about it. And it also said, which was wonderful, we hope that family issues are not a problem for any faculty member. And there, that changed a lot of family policies. We were all on the outside <laughs> wondering whether he would convince them <laughs> to do it. And it took hours. They were in that room for hours. And finally, they came out. They all had signed it. We had written it, gave it to Chuck, and they all had signed it. And I think also you just have to look around, like you said earlier, I mean, the number of universities that now have women presidents is far, far greater than it used to be. Oh, you know, when I look just at engineering at MIT, when we did our report, there was there had only ever been one woman who had had any kind of administrative position. Sheila Widnall mm -hmm. was associate provost for a year before she came, became secretary of the Air Force. And now something like 20 percent of the senior admin, of the sort of administrative positions, you know, associate dean or dean or whatever in engineering, now they're women. And I think you can look at other universities across the country. There's far more women in administrative roles as you know, deans, as provosts, as presidents than there were 30 years ago when we were doing this work. I don't think any of us in the original group of women from the School of Science could have imagined the, 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 the consequence of the work that we set out to do now 30 years ago. I mean, we were just functioning day to day, <laughs> just hoping <laughs> to keep things together. I mean, we couldn't have imagined this in our wildest dreams. Well, let me end by thank you. Uh, it's uh, wonderful. I enjoy the conversation a lot. You've made an incredible difference. And for me, it's a treat, honestly, to be here with you after being a colleague for so many years and not seeing you for so many years. <laughs> yes. So thank you again. I appreciate it. <laughs>